to our community of practice session. And um, most of you by now know that I'm Jayashri Ayer. And with me, I have Neha. Um, uh, and I, we also have Anit and Gauri. And as we always um, tell, uh, introduce Anit and Gauri as our backbone. They are indeed our backbone. And they look after everything uh, to do with the back end. And they're very silent workers. So, but, um, you know, Without their silent and efficient work, we will not be able to do any of these webinars or you know, virtual workshops that we do. Thank you, Aneha and uh, Gauri, very much for your efforts. So um, before we go on to today's session, I just want to kind of make a small inquiry. I hope all of you are doing well and staying safe with your families. Um, the last two, two and a half months has been extremely and incredibly, uh, you know, difficult for us as a nation. Um, our whole country has been reeling under COVID and we have lost many of our loved ones. Uh, we've lost a few educators as well. And it's been incredibly, incredibly tough for everyone. And sure enough, I'm sure it must be very tough for our students too. So I know as schools, and as educators and leaders, we've been trying to reach out as much as possible to our students and their families. Um, however, you know, it is kind of a little um, optimistic uh, feeling now that we are, we are slowly coming out of that deep crisis. <laughs> our numbers are slowly reducing and, you know, all the states that went into lockdown one after another are slowly now relaxing um, their uh, restrictions and hopefully things will really, really brighten up maybe in a month or two from now. Um, but amidst all of this, uh, you know, we as teachers and school leaders have been continuing to do our work. And uh, we have closed one school session and now we are in the process of, you know, gearing up for the next academic session. And uh, a big game changer that is going to be there for us in the new session is the National Education Policy 2020. And uh, many state governments are really trying uh, uh, to see how they can implement the national education policy. And uh, as we've been talking in the last two uh, episodes, you know, one of the main focus areas in this uh, education policy is to do with foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, and uh, according to this policy, we are right now uh, having a huge learning crisis because more than five crore children are not meeting the reading uh, writing levels and also the numeracy levels. So, uh, you know, that's supposed to be a uh, national emergency according to, them, according to the national education policy. And that is why, um, you know, the theme for this three-part webinar series was all to do with uh, numeracy, literacy, and numeracy. And in the last two um, episodes, we kind of delved deep into what does uh, literacy learning look like and what does numeracy learning look like. And, um, you know, across the countries, wherever, as Adhyan um, review, school uh, you know, leaders, um, we've done uh, school reviews as uh, lead assessors, uh, you know, what we've really found is um, very unfortunately, the whole understanding of literacy and numeracy is found wanting. So because in our country, the way we look at these uh, two terms, literacy and numeracy, is just the English textbook and the math textbook. Uh, and, you know, so doing a few question and answers from the English textbook and doing a few problems from the math textbook is what we call literacy and numeracy. And so that was the reason of really going into what does really numeracy look like and what does really good literacy learning look like? And at this point in time, I would request Neha to kind of um, flash some important relevant data that we have from Adhyayan, uh, which you know, is uh, going to be really um, important for us to understand um, in regard to literacy and numeracy. So if you look at the library statistics that this you see on the screen, uh, it's just about a 12% of our schools which can confidently say that they have a school library and it has both fiction and non-fiction books and also students engage with these books because they are of you know, uh, age appropriate for their students. But we have a huge 69% saying where we've seen that 
they don't have this at all. And as we all know, this is something extremely important for, you know, if we have to really talk about literacy. And um, similarly, when we talk about the literacy and the numeracy curriculum itself, again, as I told you, it's just the textbook. So it's hugely, what is found wanting is really the understanding about what really literacy is and what is numeracy. And so the highlight of the last two episodes was um, that you know, literacy and numeracy is totally beyond the textbook. And it is actually about how we really kind of transfer this to real life. And um, uh, that actually has to be, uh, needs to be taught in schools as skills rather than just kind of helping children do uh, you know a few question answers or some problems from the textbook and literacy literacy literally extends into other learning areas and uh, with regard to numeracy the use of numeracy skills across curriculum enriches the study of each and every other curricular area and this contributes to the development of a broader and deeper understanding of numeracy itself so these were the highlights of the discussion that we had in the last two um, uh, you know, episodes on literacy and numeracy. And if this has to be implemented in a school, obviously there is a major role for school leaders. And achieving excellence and equity in literacy and numeracy is obviously at the forefront, forefront of the school leadership. So what is the role of school leaders in really managing literacy and numeracy is what we're going to be talking about today. And we have two very, very um, eminent school leaders with us who will be in conversation. And uh, we can listen to them to see what are some of those practical ideas that we get out of this conversation so that we can take back to our school. But before I really introduce um, Spokey Wheeler and Tom Power. I'm going to now uh, request um, Neha to open up a Mentimeter for us. And um, if you can put your thoughts on this Mentimeter slide as to what are some of the questions or maybe even some challenges that you face when it comes to implementing good numeracy and good literacy in your school. So it could be some questions that you have and for which you're you know, looking at answers or you're confused about, or it could be that you've already tried and implementing, uh, tried and implementing this and you've had to face some challenges. So you could feel free to please put in your thoughts on this Mentimeter. So uh, all that you have to do is copy this uh, Mentimeter link that is there on the chat and open a new uh, tab on your browser and then you will get onto this Mentimeter slide. So we'll take a couple of minutes for this. If you face any difficulty, please let us know. We see a couple of inputs coming in. Keep it going, yes. The words that are used the most are the ones that get highlighted and we can see that at the center, which is the lack of interest. 
Lack of resources is the next one that's coming in. Yeah, so. Another 30 seconds more. Very interesting, so please. Let's let's do it. Yeah. We've got thirty percent responses. So while you're doing this, maybe I um, introduce our um, panelists today. So we have Spokey Wheeler with us. And uh, for those of you who are, have been associated with uh, Adhyayan, I'm sure you're very, very um, you know, familiar with Spokey. And uh, he's uh, the co-founder, he's co-founded Adhyayan Quality Services with uh, Kavita Anand. And uh, Spokey is currently heading the Heritage International Experiential Learning School in Gurgaon. Um, otherwise, Spokey has a very, very rich experience in the field of education. He is also the director at Bespoke Education Solutions and, in, and an international associate, London Center School of Center for Leadership and Learning. Um, he brings about four decades of international experience and expertise in leadership and management of teaching and learning to Indian education, and he's been immersed in Indian education for the last 10 years or even more than 10 years. And his career spans across many countries um, like the UK, Singapore, Malaysia, Germany, India, and Africa. And he has successfully led, transformed, and reviewed schools. He's worked with government, schools, commercial, and not-for-profit organizations, donor agencies, universities, and international partners. His impact was evident in the school leadership of secondary schools in Germany, Hampshire, and inner London, where he took Burlington Dane School out of special measures in a single year and led its transformation as the first fast track academy in England. His school leadership was complement to support rural and urban low cost mid-fee, as well as high-ending schools in India and internationally. Spooky's work has undertaken rigorous work to support both leaders and improve the quality of education in India and across Asia. This includes commissions with the World Bank to support the internationalization of teacher training and CSR development in India, in, an, in association with Absolute Return for Kids, ARK. He designed the School Leaders India program to create leaders of local trusts and NGO schools in Mumbai and Pune. As an international education consultant for the Open Universities, teacher education through school-based support, Spokey worked closely with the Indian Ministry of Human Resource Development and senior government administrators across the Indian states of Assam, Bihar, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Orissa, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. Spokey's collaboration with the Open University continued on its award-winning English in Action program in Bangladesh and currently on its iGate literacy and numeracy project in Zimbabwe, leading the design and delivery of their leadership strategy. So uh, you can see very clearly that Spokey has had um, a very rich experience in school leadership and teacher professional development across the globe. And um, very fortunately, both Neha and I have worked closely with uh, Spokey uh, in Adhyayan, um, you know, and we've done uh, school reviews where Spokey has actually mentored us and uh, coached us in, uh, and what, and certainly I can say for myself what I am today is a lot to do with what Spokey has really taught me and I've learned from him. And along with Spokey, we have 
Tom Power today. And those of you who've been with us in, our, in the previous two episodes are familiar with Tom. And Tom has been also associated with Spokey in the projects uh, in my English in Action program in Bangladesh and also in the Literacy and Numeracy project in Zimbabwe. And Tom is also going to talk to us today about his experience in how he has um, helped teachers and leaders in Zimbabwe and Bangladesh implement numeracy and uh, literacy. And Tom has over 20 years of experience in design and delivery of EdTech enhanced teacher development research and program delivery in the global south. He leads the International Teacher Education for Development Research Group at the Open University. His research is at the intersection of mobile learning, teacher education, and international development, developing innovative approaches that are capable of large scale, low unit cost, high impact uh, outputs. In his role as academic director of the FDCO funded English in Action program Bangladesh, he led a team of national and international researchers to conceptualize, design, and deliver the 3 million pound research monitoring and evaluation component, which tested the effectiveness of a model of ed tech enhanced school-based teacher continuous professional development from proof of concept to a national scale. And he's used mixed methods, including a CASI experimental study in his research. So um, he has also published many of his work in uh, journals such as the Professional Development and Education, Transforming Government, People, Process and Policy, the Curriculum Journal and Open Learning, the Journal of Open Distance Learning. Tom has also been a regular presenter at Commonwealth of Learning, MLearn and eLearn Africa, and has been invited to speak on teacher education, education technology and inter international development at Oxford, Cambridge and Harvard universities. So uh, welcome, Spokey and Tom. And uh, we are looking at your experience. Uh, and I'm sure the school leaders today here are e eagerly looking at some practical and accessible device that they can um, advise that they can take back to their schools to implement numeracy and uh, literacy in their schools. Over to you, Tom. Hi, thank you ever so much. Um, sorry, just let me, uh, I've lost the screen with the presentation, there we go. Uh, I think it's really interesting just looking at the, the Mentimeter and, and uh, the, the kind of lack of motivation and the lack of... Uh, just a minute, I'll just mute them here. Okay, sorry. Thanks. I, I think it's really interesting the uh, the comments that were coming up on Mentimeter about the lack of motivation and the lack of interest in literacy and numeracy. Um, and I, I just want to share with you very informally some reflections from working with teachers and school leaders uh, in Bangladesh and, and in Zimbabwe over the, the last decade. Uh, and uh, lack of motivation and lack of interest is something that you quite often hear from uh, head teachers when you ask about the community or from teachers when you ask about the learners and they say oh they're not very interested in learning um, and I just want to share two uh, two experiences that I had that made me think about that I was very struck um, one of the last things we did in Bangladesh was to organize a, a research program for teachers where teachers picked something that was interesting to them in, in their own practice and, and carried out some research with support from my project over a couple of terms to see what they could find out about that issue and how they could they could try and find it uh, address it and they we had a conference at the end of the um, the program that was in the, the most prestigious university in Bangladesh uh, there were people from the Ministry of Education that came and uh, the, the teachers really blew away the academics and the, the people from the ministry who were astonished at how articulate uh, some of the teachers were about the issues that they faced. But one of the, the presentations that struck me the most, and I've, I've just been able to find his, his, uh, his write-up of his research, was a, a secondary teacher um, who essentially, I, I think, was very, very brave. 
And he said, when I began this research, what I wanted to do was find out why my students are not interested and not motivated to learn. And the attendance is very low. I should have 120 children in my class. There are 20 that turn up. Uh, and, and I wanted to know why the children weren't bothered to come to the class or what was preventing them. And, and, I, and he said, I thought the problem was the students. And what I found through my research was that the problem was me. And I thought that was an incredibly brave thing to say to a room full of hundreds of your colleagues and people from the ministry and researchers. And when he explained it, uh, and I, I'm looking at the, the chart from his findings now, it said, actually, the, the children were afraid of corporal punishment. They, 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 you know, I, I was a dictator in my classroom is one of the phrases that he used. Uh, yeah, I, that... Um, the, the classes were boring, uh, that the teachers weren't very active, the teachers themselves weren't active and the children weren't active and children voted with their feet. Uh, and, and it was really quite a journey for this teacher to go, actually, I need to do something about this. It's me that needs to change, not my learners. And I, I think if you're struggling with children who are not motivated to learn in your class or not interested in learning, then you know you you really have to have a, a long hard look at, at what is at the root of that. Talk to the children and find out why. Do do some research. Probe, find out what what is it that's that's making them disinterested. I, I'm also reminded of a, an experience from Zimbabwe, where um, there was a a teacher, uh, a, again, a secondary school teacher of mathematics, and he'd been working over a, a couple of terms when I met him to, uh, to improve foundation skills. Uh, and this teacher said, you know, when an, it, it used to be that um, when I, it was time for the maths lesson, I, I would walk into the classroom and the children would be sat with their heads on their hands on the desk and they'd all look really fed up and bored. And I, I'd do the lesson and it was really hard work and I had to be really strict to get them to pay attention. Uh, and, and I, you know, as a very strict teacher, I had to shout at them. Uh, and he said, but now when I go into the master, and they're all sat up, they're ready, the faces are bright and smiling. And he said, and sometimes I'm, I'm talking to the head teacher, I have some admin to do, and I'm a few minutes late. And the children come and get me and say, sir, it's time for a maths lesson. Uh, and the difference was that he'd begun uh, running a club for the foundation skills outside the lesson and he thought in this club he needed to do things differently so he used games he played things like snakes and ladders and things like that and got them counting and, and children really enjoyed that and then he began to think well you know some of those things that we're doing in the club maybe I could try some of those things in my lesson and and his reflection at the end of this journey, when I was uh, interviewing him after a few months, he said, I used to think the only way you could get children to, to learn and, and to work for you was to be very strict and very firm. And what I've learned is that if you make learning fun and enjoyable, and if you're a friendly teacher, children work five times harder for the friendly teacher than for the strict teacher. And so again, when you're struggling with motivation, and children being disinterested, I, I think we really have to look at what is it we're doing in the classroom to make learning interesting, to make learning active, engaging, and, and to make sure that we're, we're giving children the, the activities that they need. So I, I was just really struck by the, uh, the results from that Mentimeter. And I, I'm sorry, that's speaking very frankly, uh, and very, very boldly. Uh, I, I hope I've not offended anybody with that. Uh, I, I just think my, yeah, my experience has been, um, it's, it's very common to find that, that and, and quite often the issues are to do with us and our, our school and the education we're offering rather than the, the problems with the children. On that, <laughs> Neha, could we uh, start the presentation? So this is quite an unusual presentation for me. Uh, normally what I present is, is kind of very uh, grounded in literature and, and theories of learning and things uh, uh, and, you know, large scale data. Uh, 
what I want to talk to you about today is really just grounded very much in personal experience and reflection from working with um, hundreds and thousands of schools over the, the last decade and, and looking uh, particularly in recent years at, at leadership of learning. And so Spokey and I are going to do a bit of a double act. I'm just going to kind of raise six areas that I think are really important in terms of school leadership and what you can do that can make a difference to learning in your school. And then I'm, on each of those, I'm going to turn and invite Spokey uh, to reflect from his experience as a school leader, because I've, I've worked with a lot of schools. I've never been a school leader, uh, but Spokey has, and he's got that, that experience to share. Uh, Neha, could we have the, the next slide? And the, the first one that I want to raise really echoes what, what we've been talking about before. It's about working in partnership. And every time I visit a school, the first thing that you do is you have to have a cup of tea with the head teacher and you have a chat about how things are going. And one of the things I almost always ask is, how are things with the school and the community? And I, I think in Bangladesh and in Zimbabwe, the, the most common answer I get is, it's hard. The community are not very interested in learning. And when you ask a little bit more about that, what they mean is, ah, it's hard. The community are not very interested in paying the school fees. And one of the things that Spokey and Cavita did for us in Zimbabwe was to get the school leader, the, the head teacher, and the, the chair of the school development committee together for a couple of days uh, and actually to, to share what they appreciated about what each other was doing. Uh, and that uh, actually many of them were, there were many tearful <laughs> conversations that happened around that. Um, but teachers, uh, school heads and, and school development committee chairs went away from that that weekend um, with the sense that they wanted to tackle issues of literacy and numeracy together. And what we found coming out of that was lots of stories of not necessarily anyone paying any more school fees, but parents being very involved in trying to support literacy and numeracy in the school. So being involved in things like bringing in reading materials that might be newspapers or um, packaging with, with things on that people could read or bringing in resources that you could use for counting and doing numeracy, um, helping uh, not with the money, but with building new classrooms or with um, supporting the school building playgrounds and things like that. They, they got uh, really powerful support from the community when they, they put the issue of school fees aside for a moment and said, actually, what we want to do is work together to improve learning. And if I could just share one, one last quick anecdote on this one. The first school that I went to in Zimbabwe um, the head said all those things that the community are not interested in learning, they're not bothered about learning, and it's very hard to engage them. And then a few minutes later, I was talking to a group of, of mothers, and then a few minutes later, a group of fathers. And the parents were passionately concerned about learning. And they knew that the school was making very little progress in literacy and numeracy. And I, I remember one mother who who was emphatic uh, and she was saying, the school send us these reports saying the children are doing okay, but I know that my child can't read. And it's very difficult as a school leader, I think, when large numbers of children are, are struggling with basic skills. But I think it's really important to be honest with parents and caregivers about where children are. Um, and to signal your commitment to do something about that. And I met Mrs. Matamali, a head teacher in Zimbabwe in a, a very, very remote school. And Mrs. Matamali had been at the school for three years and, and the school pass rate had gone, it was a primary school, had gone from almost zero to uh, about 25%. It had gone up five or 6% each year she'd been there. And when you asked, what, what had made that change? Uh, uh, and and you, you, you noticed that the change had began at the time she joined the school. She said, you know, what, what, the thing about me is I'm passionate about learning and I'm passionate about reading and writing and I want every child in the school to learn. And so we start every lesson 
with uh, every day we start with a, a period of, of literacy skills and, and helping children read and I, I've, I'm making reading cards I'm just out of bits of cardboard I'm making reading materials for all the children and, and every week every child in the school has to write something and I read what they've written and, and that, te that was a head teacher who just really signaled to the community and to all of the school I want every child in my school to be literate and I'm, I'm not going to stop until they are. And, and she really got the community on board. Spokey. Hey. Um, I'm now in a, a very privileged school, uh, Heritage International in Gorgal. Um, my first experience was setting up a school for with uh, um, a fee base of 175 to 220 rupees per month per child. Um, and yet, I think the principles of working in the community and working together aren't very different. Uh, and, and the focus isn't. I, I can remember very early on going out into the community, going into different villages, um, meeting up with one young child who'd learned two, two uh, words in English in her um, uh, English medium school. The second one was up, the first one was shut. Um, and the only two words she knew were the words that indicated that she should keep quiet and that her voice should not be heard and she should have no agency. I, I guess I... I, I I wanted just before I do the community piece to just say one general thing that came through to me uh, very strongly um, uh, when we joined you in, in Dhaka. Um, uh, and it was, we need to get to a place where school leaders do no harm. Um, mm -hmm. at, at the very least that they don't get in the way of student learning. But critically, we create an environment in which the culture in which children learn and families recognize they have a role is a really, really significant one. Uh, again, in Ranchi, I can remember um, uh, a parent coming to complain to me about the fact that their child was really irritating them um, because uh, he was standing on the doorstep uh, going up, going um, up one, down one up one, down one. She said, what's he doing? I said, he's learning to count. Um, and I, I think for me, the, the critical piece that I see everywhere is, is how you can engage the local community, but context is everything. And so the context might be um, uh, where you are fortunate enough to get some support from a local company. Um, they're not going to give you any money, but they might give you their bright young things to then sit down and read alongside um, uh, your children. They might give you uh, an opportunity not so much for resource, but for engagement in conversation. And I think for me, the, the, the essence of community is around actually the school being at the heart of the community. And my example now isn't, uh, isn't a one to do with literacy. Uh, I think probably the thing that I value about the school I'm in most is what's been happening since we've been in COVID, which as the school's work has changed almost completely from looking at learning to looking at supporting and caring for the families of the community. And the, the, the works that has been done there will mean that it's so much easier. This isn't, that's not the reason why it's done. But then when we talk to the community about how they can help us to help our children learn and to help the children in other schools learn. You know, I've just come away from a great event this morning, um, uh, which was on uh, Global Development Day, um, where, where children were going out into the community to look at the destruct destruction of our environment. If we're looking at opportunities for community involvement, it might be like it is in Pune in one of the Akanksha schools that I can remember vividly uh, working on the creation of a library. Um, the SMC having a really functional role as, as parents in helping things happen and then um, ending up managing to get, um, I think it was Star Chemicals to make a really big investment to create the libraries. But the, 
whatever we do in terms of engagement in the community, we have to be front facing. We have to, as leaders, make it absolutely clear that, um, that our interest is in their families and their children and their abilities that, of the children to learn and critically, I guess, to read. So I, I think it's got much more to do with a cultural engagement, but a deliberate understanding of my context today, because my context in um, uh, during the Gulf War in England was of getting children to write airmail letters to their parents um, who were out in the Gulf. My context in, in Jharkhand um, was a very different one to the one we have now. And it's about starting to say, who can we find within the community who can support us to enable our children to become more literate, more numerative, but importantly, to be able to communicate more effectively. Thank you, Spokey. Um, and I, I'd just like to say before we, we move on from working in partnership that I, th I think I, when I, I put that down, I did mean primarily working in partnership with the community, but also I, I think it's, it's true as a school leader, you need to work in partnership with your teachers and your school. Uh, and, and, and I think when we look at the challenge of schools that have very low levels of literacy and numeracy, it is about signaling as a leader that, that that's something that you recognize and that you're committed to doing something about, and then bringing the caregivers and the wider community, but also bring the teachers with you on, on, on going, yeah, you know, it may be that we've been used to just teaching to the, the 10 or 20% of the children who are where they should be in the curriculum, and I'm, I'm okay for the others to sit quietly in the back of the classroom and be ignored. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm, I'm going to make sure that all of the children are going to learn and, and really kind of being able to, to communicate that commitment to your school and to your, your, your families uh, and, and to bring people with you in, in saying that that's something we're going to tackle together. It's not something you can do on your own. It's something that has to be an issue for the whole school. Yeah. And it's right, it just struck me that one of the things in, um, uh, in London that we worked on, we had a very large Afro-Caribbean community and getting the uh, some successful Afro-Caribbean fathers to take part in a literacy campaign where they were sitting alongside the children, helping them to learn to read. Yeah. If we could move on to the next slide, Neha. Thank you. And then the second point is around assessment data. Um, and when we were trying to get this on, on school leaders' uh, agendas in Zimbabwe, we began with international data and, and then some data that we had from the, the projects and kind of went, well, look, the, you know, the international data suggests that actually half of all of the children in the whole world don't have the literacy and numeracy skills that they should have by the time they leave primary school. So, you know, this is a global problem. It's everywhere. It applies to every school. Um, but it's also a problem that applies more acutely uh, the, the lower income the household and the community in the country is. Uh, and and in, we were working in, in Zimbabwe as a low income country. We work and we can say, well, the, you know, around the whole world uh, in low income countries, uh, the data suggests it's the vast majority of children who are, who are um, going to be struggling with this. Now, where do we think, what, what, how, how does that relate to our experience? What do you think the situation is like in your school? How widespread a problem is that? And the data was quite helpful in terms of being able to go, it's not, it's not that there's a problem with your school. It's, this is, this is a, a global problem. And, and it's a problem that's particularly acute in many countries. And our, you know, the, the, the issues that we face in our school are, are not because our a uh, 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 great failing on our school. It, it's actually just part of a, a worldwide challenge, and, and I think having that 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 kind of understanding that this is this is not about an individual teacher who's failing or a, a school that are not doing well. This, this is a problem that is is faced around the world in very big scale. It was quite helpful for heads to be able to say, actually, yeah, we are, we're experiencing that in our school too. What we found was really helpful though was when teachers had. Uh, instruments that they could use to assess literacy and numeracy skills um, 
uh, and actually find out which skills children had and which skills children were still struggling with or still trying to develop. And very often teachers were really surprised by the results of those assessments. And we found uh, teachers that were, were, were saying, actually, you know, e even in my, my top set, I found there were still some children who, who I didn't realize I thought they could do this piece of numeracy or I thought they had this skill in literacy, um, but actually they don't. They're really struggling with it. And, and the child can read fluently uh, several sentences from this book, so I think they can read, but I hadn't stopped to ask them to explain to me what it meant. And then when I said, well, you know, <laughs> his three little questions about that sentence you've just read, they, they couldn't answer the questions. And I didn't realize they, they, they could see the words and say the words. They didn't know what the words meant or they, they, they didn't know what the sentence meant when you put the words together. So I, I think one of the things that I would really encourage you to do in your schools is, is to um, find ways of assessing literacy and numeracy. Where are the children? Do you know what skills they're struggling with, what skills they've got? In my own childhood, um, I, I was very struck uh, when I went from primary school to secondary school. Um, the head teacher there, I, I, I think it, he was quite unique in this, but his personal commitment was that um, every child that joined the school moving up from primary school to secondary school, he spent five or ten minutes with every child in the first two weeks of the, uh, the year listening to them read and did a reading assessment. And he said, uh, and, and he explained to me as a child, because I asked him why he was doing it. Uh, and he said, well, first of all, I really want to know what the reading level of is of all the children in my school. And I, I, I think that in, that's very important information for me to know as a head teacher. And secondly, I think it's really nice to have five or 10 minutes to get to know each individual child in my school as they come to the school and so that they know me. And I can remember at the age of 11 thinking, gosh, that's really good. <laughs> Um, so again, as, as heads, I just challenge you, do you know where your children are in their literacy and numeracy? Do you know what their reading's like? Do you know what they're struggling with? Do your teachers know? Uh, and and uh, stopping and, and, and actually looking carefully at assessment data on that, making sure you've got good information, it often really challenges teachers' understanding. And, and on a positive note, I was very struck. Um, I went to one secondary school uh, just before the pandemic and they'd been doing literacy and numeracy clubs after school for a group of about 30 or 40 learners in one particular year. And they'd chosen those learners uh, as being the ones who, who had the, the biggest problems. When we gave them an assessment tool in literacy and numeracy, they, they, they assessed that year. Uh, and they were really surprised. They were going, and some of these children who we've been doing literacy and numeracy clubs with for the last year, they're doing better on this assessment than the children who are in the top set. And so actually just, you know, having spent two or three terms of, of work on literacy and numeracy can really, really make a big difference to children's attainment. And, and being able to have good assessment data uh, on, on that can be really motivating and encouraging when you see the changes that children can make. Over to you, Spokey. So I guess to begin with, the, there's very basic stuff, isn't there? Is that um, if we talk crudely about baseline assessments, we need to be able to understand where a child is to understand what they need to do to take the next step. And so being able to use tools which will help us to, to, to understand the degree to which children are literate and numerate is really, really important. Some schools, I remember Shishuvan when I first uh, uh, went there, maybe 12 or 13 years ago, um, uh, when it inducted children in for the first three weeks, there was a, all of the time was actually an assessment and evaluation of the children um, through a, a wide range of activities, which included the cognitive, but also began to give a sense of where children were. I guess the, I, I want to come back to what you said very early on. Um, uh, Tagore, uh, uh, probably India's most famous poet, talked about learning without fear. Mm. Is um, uh, if we're endeavoring to discover how literate and numerate our children are, we have to be in a position where they're going to be prepared to speak 
feel confident to, to, to come up with thoughts and ideas. If I look at the vast majority of primary classes that I have visited over um, 25 states and union territories in India, they have been directive and didactic, even though the children have been as young as four or five. In that environment, it's not possible for a teacher to be able to understand where their child children are. It may be possible to uh, engage in rote learning, which will take the child forward a small way in knowledge, but will take them forward nowhere in terms of understanding. So for me, I think the first one, again, keeps on coming back to the culture of the classroom, the culture of the school. We create an environment in which children feel confident and happy to speak and participate. And then we look at strategies which will enable that to occur. Um, I said I'm in a really fortunate place at the moment. Um, uh, my kids are very privileged and their families are generally very privileged. So we're putting children to breakout rooms in small um, uh, literacy groups where it's not possible not to know because um, the process is, is, is transparent and in front of us. But I guess if we're looking at early years, um, we, we first have to make a judgment call and everyone, every teacher has to understand. So what does grade li one literacy and numeracy look like? What is it we're trying to achieve? And then how can we um, find out uh, how we can create um, a joy and interest in that reading and, um, uh, and, and through number? Uh, I'm an English teacher. So for me, love of reading and writing is absolutely critical. But the, it, it is that ability to say what data is important which will help us to learn and how can we share the data between ourselves and others. Uh, and, and, and I think it's that. Sometimes the data is going to come from home. But a lot of the time, what we've got to do more than anything else as leaders is create an environment in which it's possible for our teachers to talk together about their learning. Uh, one of the things I loved about working in Jharkhand um, uh, uh, was that we had um, uh, circle time every evening for teachers. And in that circle time, we sat down together and we talked about the experiences of the day and the learning of the children and the aspects of their learning that were, were problematic and beneficial. I guess one thing that I'm more and more clear about is that the impact of being able to read fluently has an enormous consequence mm. to a child, much more so. And, and if you were looking at those schools that, that can afford to, and actually I'm gonna tell you in a moment, that's all schools. The investment that most of us are now beginning to make in literacy in the first instance and I got to be honest, in numeracy to a lesser degree, um, is about identifying with as great clarity as possible where the child is to enable us then to know if we're really lucky through guided reading programs, um, uh, how we're going to take children to the next step. I can't remember whether you're going to ask me about resources today, but I just wanted to pick up on the fact that um, and to do that with, with literacy, you have to have text in front of them. There has to be the opportunity for that to yeah. occur. And the National Book Foundation, a wonderful institution based in Fasant Kunj, um, I can remember in my 175 rupee um, uh, per child per month school, we spent 5,000 rupees per classroom and created wonderful class libraries, which we would then shared with each other so that children got the opportunity to read. And during those times, teachers would wonder, would sit, would listen, would question, would ask. The brighter children would then support the others. So for me, on the one hand, obviously there is the need to create, create coherent data that tells us exactly where the child is, but most importantly, create the culture in which that data can then be beneficially used to help children to find a joy and excitement in learning. Yeah. Thank you, Spokey. Um, 
Nayla, I'm, if we could move on, we'll skip that slide and come back to that, if that's okay. Uh, and the reason for that is that I think there's, I'm, I'm sorry, my Zoom's gone a bit funny. I'm just trying to find the chat again. There's some really good comments and questions in, in the chat that have come through that I just want to uh, mention before we, we move on to this next one on CPD in the school. Uh, and there's quite a few comments, uh, Rajesh saying that the challenge of teacher knowledge and skills and knowing how to assess and what the students' literacy and numeracy levels is huge in the small private schools. Um, and another comments around um, the, the need for, for teachers to know more about this. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about in this slide now, which is why I've come forward to that. Um, the, but another comment I just wanted to pick up on was, uh, do you think interacting in, with students in preschool and elementary levels in local languages and using local examples will build a stronger base in basic literacy and numeracy than trying to set them a mold through the same textbooks for all students? And I, I think there's an awful lot of research from uh, all over the world over several decades now that says, yeah, starting in, in the children's local language in the mother tongue is, is really, really helpful, particularly when children are young uh, in terms of developing their literacy. Uh, and even if you're going to move on to a, a, a target language for the medium of instruction that's not the mother tongue, children will get there much quicker and be much stronger at it if they first get a foundation in literacy in their mother tongue. Um, so especially when children are, are younger in, in infant school and junior school, uh, I would really encourage you to promote the use of mother tongue or of code switching, moving between languages uh, while children are becoming proficient in literacy and numeracy. In terms of that teacher development, um, teachers needing the skills for assessment, teaching needing the skills for teaching literacy and numeracy. Uh, again, just anecdotally, um, the first school I went to in Zimbabwe, I, I, I spoke to a, a, a young teacher who was saying, you know, basically everything's fine in my classroom. And then we had this conversation about all those, you know, the, the international evidence would suggest lots of children struggle with literacy and numeracy. Is that a problem for you? And he's like, no, not really. And then you kind of go a little bit great and goes, oh, well, yes, actually three quarters of the children can't read. And you're going, well, and how, how does that affect your teaching? And he said, well, I do what I can. I, I, I teach the ones who, who can follow. Um, but the others, I, I, I don't really know what to do with. And, and he said something that I thought was very powerful next. He said, I'm a junior school teacher and I, I was trained as a junior school teacher and no one ever taught me how to teach children how to do basic reading and writing and how to count because they're meant to have learnt those, those skills in infant schools. And I think it's all the more true for secondary school teachers. You know, the, the assumption is that children get these skills in their early years and in infant school, and it's not a problem by the time you get to junior and secondary school. But the truth is, for most children around the world, it's still very much a problem in junior schools and secondary schools, because most children don't get those skills in infant school. So how do we help if, if you're leading a junior school or a secondary school, many of your teachers won't ever have had any training in teaching literacy and numeracy at the very basic levels. So how can you address that? What can you do about it? And one of the things that uh, I got from Spoken Cavita is a, 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 a meta study of, of interventions in education around the world. Uh, and the finding of that was that the, the single biggest difference you can make as a head teacher is to lead and take part in professional development with teachers in your school. So just saying, you know, if you can do one thing, if, if you come out of this workshop thinking there's one thing you're going to do about literacy and numeracy, that one thing should be to, to set up and lead and take part in professional development around literacy and numeracy for the teachers in your school. And I know the next question is going to be, ah, but <laughs> what do we do? Where do we get some help? Let me give you two things that you might be able to use. Um, the first uh, is not letting me post that for some reason. Hang on a moment. Um, try again. There we go. That's a link to a, a set of professional development courses that are uh, freely available. They're, they're 
produced by states in India. They're available. I think the link I've sent you is in English, but they're in at least half a dozen other uh, Indian languages as well. Um, and they're short pieces of study. There are some on literacy, some on numeracy that you've, you could use as a starting point. Uh, for thinking about professional development and literacy and numeracy. Uh, and I, I hope those materials might be useful for you. You may well come across others. Please please share them am amongst the ADIAN network if you find things that are helpful. The other thing that I'd like to just share with you quickly is, is from the same project in India. Um, but this is a YouTube channel full of videos uh, around teaching and learning, uh, assessment, pair work, group work, literacy, numeracy, other stuff as well. Uh, they're, they're all quite brief videos, uh, they're in a variety of Indian languages, but, I th but they're very, very practical in terms of how do we do something differently in the classroom that will help. So I, I hope, it, you know, use those, look for others. If, if people find things that are good, share them with each other. You've got a fantastic resource in, in your, your network that we're, with, we're together with today. Find and share things that are useful for professional development in your schools. If something works well, tell 10 other head teachers about it. Um, uh, and, and, and I just encourage you to do that. And Spokey, I'll, I'll stop wittering now. And you're on mute. <laughs> The best training and resource um, provision in the world exists inside here. It's called Google. It's called YouTube. It's called being part of rich professional learning communities. And I think that if there is a theme today, it is a theme about collaboration, Tom. It is yeah. a theme about um, and, and maybe in times of COVID, and, and it struck me working with you in Zimbabwe, the challenge of the impoverishment of so many teachers who weren't being paid, who didn't know whether or not they were going to be able to put enough food on the table. You couldn't look for rich resources other than human, other than being able to share with someone else. In that case, very often it was the local community. But I, but I think that idea of professional le learning communities is quite critical um, because it will enable us to know better how best we can work with each other. Um, and and uh, yeah, examples like TESS India, um, uh, that there is so much out there that we can call on that we can use for professional development. But you're right, Vivian Robinson talked about the single most important aspect was the promotion and participation in teacher development um, on student achievement. Um, and that again comes back to a very simple thing. If you're not inside the classroom, how can you on the one hand know what the classroom looks like and how can you enable teachers to know that the one thing you're more interested in than anything else is student learning? You might be worthily involved inside your office. You might be plagued with, as I think I am most of the time, days filled with meetings. But actually, the more you as a leader can front up, can be visible and tangible, the more confidence your teachers will have. It will also help you to find which are the teachers who are doing stuff even in your own school which is worthy of sharing with others, but being part of professional learning communities. And one of the things I think that Adian does really well, but could do even better, is focusing us even more on um, uh, the links that take us to some of the most important learnings. The other thing about this is, is to remember that if you're lucky, you may be a part of a network of schools. There is no reason why, as leaders, you could not identify issues of literacy and numeracy um, uh, as being significant. I know at least one network globally where um, there is a different person in each school who is the literacy czar, the numeracy czar, mm -hmm. and they will share with each other in terms of practice. And, and, and that ability to collaborate with each other is going to be, I think, more and more important in a resource poor environment. And so anything that we can do to be able to promote learning 
by sharing with each other is going to be more significant, I think, than almost anything else. Now, I'm going to up the pace a little bit and cover the last three things fairly quickly because I'm aware we've been talking at people for a long time. And uh, But I, I just want to say, uh, really to echo the, Spokey's last point on, on that uh, leading CPD in your school, which is that promoting and taking part in CPD doesn't mean you have to lead it all and be the expert in everything and you can you can delegate aspects of that task to others what's really important is that you signal to the teachers in your school that professional development is important improving the quality of teaching is important and and you're going to you expect everyone to take part in that including yourself uh Neha could we have the next slide or, or actually the previous one in this case the, the, the one on making time for learning. Thanks. So really this is just a, a, a quick point, but a very important one to say actually, how much time in, in, in a week do children get for foundation skills in literacy and numeracy? And how much time do you think they need? Are, are, are they getting enough? And, and the reason for that is this was a learning that came about after about a year of working with schools in Zimbabwe. Um, and we found um, that in some schools, the teachers were working really hard to do things like literacy and numeracy clubs after school, but children didn't seem to be making much progress. Um, and, um, you know, teachers talk, talk to you about what they're doing and how they were doing it. And it was all, all very interesting. But when you, you kind of came down to it, they were like, well, we're, we've got a group of 30 children in the literacy and numeracy club and, and we're organizing that. We, we do an hour on Thursday afternoons and we do um, half an hour on literacy and half an hour on numeracy. And you kind of go, hmm, that's probably not going to be enough. To, to really move your, your learning skills. Um, so some schools uh, set aside, they, they typically had five lessons a week for English and five lessons a week for maths. Uh, what, what happened in some schools was they said, okay, well, we're going to make sure that for all the classes that need it, we're spending at least two of those five lessons a week doing literacy and two of those five lessons a week doing numeracy. And what I mean by that is focusing on really on the foundation skills. And then in addition, for some children that needed extra support, they were doing clubs and after school activities or lunchtime activities. But I, it, so I, I think my, my advice for this would be that children probably need at least a couple of hours a week in helping them develop these skills if, if they're uh, still at, at kind of infant level and they're in junior or secondary school. They're not going to catch up on, on 20 minutes a week here and there. They're, they're going to need some substantive commitment of time and you as a school are going to have to find a way of making that. Now, one of the, the things that um, was very important in, for some of the schools in Zimbabwe with this was that they were able to get the district education officers on board. And the, the um, I remember one head teacher saying, we've, we've spoken to the district education officer and there's a national policy for, uh, for children who've fallen behind. It was called performance lag addressment. Uh, and that says if children are more than one or two grades behind where they should be, you're, you should use up to two lessons a week for, for um, English or maths to, to do these skills and offer more help for others that are doing that. So the, the district education officer has given us permission uh, to, for the next term to timetable all of our English lessons as being catch up literacy because that's what the children need. So I think it's, you know, it's just to recognize that you might need to, to take your uh, in schools inspectors and your education, local education officers with you on this to support if, if you're, uh, you're teaching things that are not necessarily what's on the, um, the grade seven curriculum, but you're going actually the children need a different level of literacy and numeracy. Um, but, but it's just crucially important that they get enough time to be able to catch up. Spokey. So two parts to this. First off, you know, um, in, in our school at the moment, we follow the International Baccalaureate, which is the, uh, the primary years program. And the units of inquiry, we build in literacy and numeracy into those units, but at the same time, critically, 
um, uh, have separate literacy and numeracy periods, which are small group periods. I, I say that because I recognize that, that on the one where we're, we're incredibly privileged in this, but actually building literacy and numeracy into your learning, into the units of um, the, the, that you plan is quite critical. Um, and giving opportunities for every child to be heard every child to be able to participate in activities which are going to help them to, to, to be more numerate. But I, I, I wanna go a bit further and say that, that it's not just um, a, a one dimensional approach. We hear about deer, drop everything and read. But actually I go into so few schools where I see people doing that. You know, drop everything and read, you know, in the end, what are we interested in? Um, I, I, I think it was Jay Shri um, uh, in one of the Chitradurga schools. Um, it might be Neha was actually with me on them. Uh, um, uh, we reached the school and before assembly started, this grade one through to 10 school, every single child was standing in the playground in groups, usually no more than six or eight, with a teacher or an older student with them, and they were reading. And they were standing upright and they were just reading. And this happened every single day because the school was making a point. It doesn't really matter what it is. And when you went to the different groups, they were doing different things. Sometimes they were doing a catch up on something they learned about yesterday. At other times, it might have been a poem but they were making a point that saying that you, you have to embed that practice. You, you, you have to have those uh, lovely story from Prerna, um, uh, our, our head of primary, um, uh, talking about a community in the South of India where um, they had a mother's reading hour and at least once every month, uh, the mothers, the, the kids would talk to their mothers and then the mothers would come in and tell stories and the children would write up those stories. Going out again into the local community to bring people in to help, but the, it's, the, it's the poster for the book that is my favourite book of the week. It's the reading in an assembly. Um, uh, it's my best read loud inside the classroom it's then finding opportunities schools where the where great reading has occurred might give a different child every week the opportunity to have a photograph taken with their book with their teacher which goes home to the parent uh, digitally the, the the piece about this is really simple it, it's not purely technical it is saying how many ways in which we can work that will recognize that we value this type of learning and how much fun can we make it? And we can't make it fun if we are like that teacher that you talked about earlier who promotes knowledge through fear and demotes learning. And so, again, it is about collaborative practices. The first time I can remember talking with um, uh, parents and taking part in a, 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 a program of paired reading, where we taught the parents how to read um, with their child at night. So all of those things, I think, are just think for yourself, think for your community, find ways of saying, Every day, there are going to be hours in which we can do stuff like this. And they here, if, if we could move on to the next slide, thanks. Yeah, so it, if, if the previous point was about making space for literacy and numeracy in your timetable and your extracurricular activities, uh, the next one is about making space for literacy and numeracy in your school development plan. And, and quite often, uh, it, it, certainly in the schools that we work with in Zimbabwe and in Bangladesh, the, the school development plan was often very much about kind of uh, building some budgets and administrative things. It was about how many books we were going to buy or how many um, uh, new classrooms we were going to build. 
Uh, and so it's just, and we've really encouraged school leaders to put learning in their school development plan. So what are you going to do in the next year that's going to improve literacy and numeracy learning? And how will you know whether or not you've been successful in doing it? And write that into your plan. So that that's something that you're tracking and reporting. Um, Spokey. So if you don't have a vision of what you want to achieve, you won't be able to create a plan of what is needed. For the, if we go back to front, for the teacher to be able to know and understand what they need to do in the classroom, there needs to be a, an absolute clarity of what our goal is. So in two days time, um, I'm gonna be sitting, sitting, listening to Prana and our literacy and numeracy teachers, the ones who are supporting, um, sharing their strategic plan. It's a strategic plan which spans not just curriculum and pedagogy, but also spans community and practice. But, and, and the plan is simply saying, if we're a school which believes in whole language, in a print rich environment, um, and we want to take these steps. These are the two or three, three things that we are going to focus on. Um, so the plan is initiated as a consequence of all of those audits at the end of every day that they do when they sit down together that help them to know where children are and how they're going to take their next steps. And then building it into a strategy which identifies this is what we're going to do, and this is the impact we are intending to achieve. This is the resource that we're going to need. Um, and that resource might be as simple as when I was in Jharkhand in, in, in Ranchi, the kids bringing seeds and bringing different types mm. of leaves, which they could use in their number classes. Um, but the, the critical bit for us is that we have to be the ones that help our teachers to look up at the horizon to see the direction in which they need to travel because all of us are on a journey here. I would suggest that the plan for literacy and the plan for numeracy is as simple as possible, is as uncluttered as possible and has at least one early win. Mm. Where having achieved this, the teachers and the children and the parents are gonna feel confident enough for us to take that next step. But the once every 30 lessons, I taught a brilliant lesson without planning. If I hadn't planned for the other 29, they wouldn't have been brilliant. Some of them would have been dreadful. You know, the, the same applies for strategic planning of a school as for a classroom, if you don't plan and prepare, you ain't going to get there. And if you talk to your children and you talk to your parents and get their inputs, as well as your teachers, the plan is going to be more rounded. Thank you. And the, uh, if, yeah, just very quickly, I, I'd like to share one last thing, which is, that actually it's possible to make really quite a big difference in a term. And I, I just want to share uh, the story of the lady on the slide here, Pauline from Zimbabwe, uh, who was a teacher in a secondary school. And she's there very proudly holding a, a big set of books that she'd managed to get together. Now, what we did with Pauline and, and a, a small group of head teachers and teachers uh, like her, was to, to say, look, we, we don't know how to do this in secondary school. We, we don't know how you make space for literacy and numeracy teaching. We know some of the, the things that are helpful, but we, we don't know how to organize it or what the issue is for your school. What we want you to do is think, what can you do that will make a difference to literacy and numeracy in a term? How will you know whether or not you've made that difference? And then go away and do it and come back next term and tell us what you've learned. And Pauline's idea was very reasonable. Her and her, her head teacher thought, actually, the problem is with literacy, the problem is we don't have any reading materials. 
So what we're going to do is I'm going to have a little mobile library. I'm going to get a box of some books and reading materials together. And then children will be able to get those from my desk and they'll be able to start reading. And, and that's going to make a difference. And that, you know, very reasonable plan. Pauline got a little box of books together, put them on her desk. And three weeks later, not a single child had ever taken a book. And she was really pulling her hair out with this. And eventually she said, after three weeks, uh, two of the children in the class came up to her and said, Miss, the reason none of us are taking the books is because we can't read them. They're too hard. And she went, oh, oh, I'd, I'd, I thought I'd, I'd kind of, you know, made the books easy. And she kind of looked around and said, well, we, we don't have anything easier in the school. There was a primary school down the road. So she went to see the primary school and said, this is what I'm trying to do. The children have said the books I've got are too, too difficult. I, you know, do you have anything? And they gave her some books that they got for children in grade five, which were two or three years below the, the grade that Pauline was trying to reach. She borrowed the grade five books and went back and put them on her desk. Uh, and, and again, she found that none of the, she was very surprised, none of the children could cope with the reading from the grade five books. So she went back to the primary school down the road again and said, they were too hard. Have you got any other reading materials? And they gave her some books from grades two and grade three. And when the children, which is, you know, end of um, infant school, beginning of junior school. And when she went back to the children with the grade two and grade three books, the children began to borrow the books and began to start reading. And, and she was like, well, my idea was right. What I learned is that my idea was right. The children did need reading materials. But what I also learned was that their reading level is far, far lower than I thought it was. And actually, that learning was transformational for Pauline. And she went on over the next year to become one of the best literacy teachers I've ever come across because she developed a real passion for helping children learn to read. Uh, uh, but but it, it began with that moment of falling, spending a term thinking, what can I do about this? And, and, and what she learned in, in that changed her life as a teacher uh, and, and has had a huge impact on the children that she's been teaching. Spokey. Um, uh, I think it used to be, my guess is the acronym was BALA which was building as a learning activity, which was common in um, government schools throughout India, um, certainly up to about five or six years ago. But the, some of the most interesting things that I've seen, which have prompted children to learn, is, is making learning real. Now, it might be that you've got the angles at the bottom of the door. It might be that your fan that goes round and round um, uh, it could be children going outside. I'm thinking of some of the Tess India videos. I can remember them looking at the children going out with teachers, looking at angles on a bicycle um, to be able to, 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 to understand where they were. So for me, um, uh, yes, small changes make big differences, but the, the, it is when someone does something tangible that the, 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 I, I think the, the biggest picture for me is we, we don't spend enough time, I think, um, sorry, I had a brain dump for a moment, um, at working out where a child is. I was, I can remember in Zimbabwe listening to uh, the secondary teachers talking about level seven kids and saying, but we have to follow the syllabus because this is what the syllabus tells us. Um, and as a consequence, the learning doesn't work. So I guess for me, the critical single issue here is what is the level that the child is at? And as a consequence of that, what is the learning that we can then promote? But the, my experience, I think our experience as teachers is when we give children um, an opportunity to own their own learning, mm. when we actively engage them in practical activities, when we then get them to sit alongside each other collaboratively, 
And then when we promote an environment in which they are going to ask questions of each other and we can ask questions of them, that's where we're going to see real accelerated learning. Um, and again, it is this thing about student agency and teacher collaborative skills in knowing how to promote a classroom environment in which learning becomes real and effective. But I guess what I'm really interested in is listening to some people who are here today mm. to talk about how much difference they made in a term. Because my comments are general. I'd be really interested in the same mm. way as you did, Tom, of uh, someone who can say, yeah, this last term, we moved on hugely because. So that's an open invitation to anybody who'd like to unmute and very uh, quickly share. Mm. We have a few minutes on hand and that'll be great. You could even put it on chat in case you're not able to unmute and talk for some reason. Anybody wants to share whatever they've done in their class, in their school? Uh, can I speak, ma'am? Yes, please go ahead. I might not uh, uh, be restricting myself to only numeracy if I'm allowed to share, you know, pedagogy as in uh, how we are trying to bring uh, engagement of children in learning. Uh, if I'm allowed to share that, I can share a few practices. So, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, at my school, which is uh, Aisha school, uh, Parvanu, I am based out of Himachal Pradesh. And uh, I came here in 2009. And the moment I saw the school, I could see a very clear sky. And the school is in a valley. So the first thought that came to me was that how could I enable, uh, you know, sky watching uh, through a telescope instead of just kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, reading it out of a book or explanation from a book. I started my research and by three. Deepak, you've gone on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry. So I was, I think uh, I was talking about uh, the need for having a telescope for my school so that we can, uh, you know, do this stargazing and, and the solar system through, you know, direct experience that the children could have. And I was uh, fortunate to have one of this uh, decent telescopes procured from a Mumbai-based organization. And uh, I had it in, uh, you know, three, a few years back. And uh, then uh, the challenge was how to organize because there is a time where you, this, you know, planets are visible. And so, and it's not in the school timings as such. Uh, some, you know, it's somewhere in the morning, four o'clock or in the evening, 8 p.m. where you actually have this, uh, you know, celestial body quite visible. Uh, but we were able to do that and uh, the children also came in, uh, you know, huge numbers, even in late nights and early mornings. And uh, the idea was just to, you know, come out of the textbook and allow that kind of experience of watching the planets. And let me tell you, the experience was beautiful. Absolutely. You, you see the Saturn with its ring, you see the, uh, you know, Venus, it looks like a moon. And then you see the Jupiter with, with its five moons. So, and absolutely, it's a different kind of experience. And uh, and we have been very consistent with this now. And every year we have this telescope watch. Obviously, it takes a huge challenge every year because it's just very dynamic to organize that. And uh, so, yeah, I think this is one of the things. And probably this is rub rubbing onto other aspects of, uh, you know, uh, you know, teaching concepts where we are, trying to move away from, you know, the rote learning or, you know, mm. abs such abstract teaching to a very concrete one. Brilliant. I hope it helps. <laughs> I don't know whether I talked uh, or out of context, but uh, just wanted to share. Spooky, you want to say something or Tom, do you want to say something to... Uh... I, I didn't get your name. Deepak. Uh, Deepak. 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 
Yeah. Really I, I, yeah. <laughs> I just want to say thanks, Deepak. I, I, I think, um, you know, getting children actively involved in doing something that, that's, uh, you know, engaging with the real world that's practical, that allows them to express their curiosity and their, their interest. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We have, uh, maybe we can take one more question or one more. Can I uh, ask a question? <laughs> yes, sure. Yes. So um, I think uh, with Tom's, um, you know, experience and uh, spooky years in terms of working with, uh, of course, governments and uh, also uh, in the Adhyan, uh, uh, you know, network, working with school managements or uh, managements who have uh, groups of schools. What could they do to promote literacy and numeracy? Um, are there, is there any kind of advice that they could do that? Because they could have really have an impact on a whole number of uh, schools that they have in their network or in their province, 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 groups of schools, right? In different. Tom, I think this is a chance for you to talk about uh, your world beating projects um, uh, where government, you work with government to enable things to occur. Yeah, I, 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 th I just think it's really important that, that the government kind of signal through their, their policy and their documents the, the importance of uh, children getting literacy and numeracy and, and uh, being able to do that, I, I think it's it's also. I mean, a lot of things that we've talked about in in the presentation this morning. So things like um, getting CPD going in schools that helps teachers improve literacy and numeracy, and providing access to resources for that, signalling the importance of, of of you know that you want everyone to to develop these skills. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just trying to think, uh, the, the really good piece of re research, Interesting Cities, which I think looked at five cities around the world, um, which had made dramatic progress. One of the things they talked about was the political will over a sustained period of time. School networks can do the same as governments. Um, uh, I know I'm lucky enough at the moment to be in a network which has decided it wants to have a literacy strategy to go across all of its schools. And so one person has been identified who has developed the program in each of the individual schools, there will be a literacy coach. Yeah. One, uh, and and the, they will then promote development, which is relevant to the schools, but the schools will then plan how they're going to work for themselves. I, I, uh, when I was in Germany, I was part of a, a, a small um, school network. It was a Br Br British Army schools, <clears throat> seven secondary schools. And as a set of school leaders, we worked together and we spent time together agreeing some things which were commonly important to us. And I think if you're in a network, you don't have to rely purely on what the overarching administration is doing, you can also promote things together yourselves. You can share. I know that in some of the work that we've done in Adyan, um, uh, triads of school leaders in different parts of the country who were close to each other would take it in turns to go into each other's schools and then do local school reviews where they could collaborate, where they would share their trainers to be able to work in each other's schools. So I, I, I think for me, again, it is about how can we creatively decide how we're going to make this happen, but the, there's got to be a political will. So I, I, I would suggest if it is important enough, and probably literacy and numeracy today are more important than they have ever been before, and as heads, as school leaders in your own school networks, you can be the catalysts for change. You can promote the opportunity for learning, even if your managements haven't, and then you can uh, find ways of working with each other. Hmm. So, so what I get is, you know, probably the leaders don't have the answers to everything, but then you no know, collaboration really helps. 
So in that sense, it is one is of course collaborating with your teachers within the school. And if it's outside of your school, then it might be with the other school network and also with the community, the parent community and the other stakeholders at large. So I think that kind of collaboration is important. And um, of course, yes, as Puki, as you just said, you know, numeracy and literacy are even more important than before. But for that matter, I think, uh, you know, good a fundamental education is not going to change, whether it, whenever it is, whenever it is going to be. And so in that sense, numeracy and literacy are the foundation of good learning. So, and that's why it's going to be always, it was important and it is going to be important even in future. And um, to, for leaders uh, to really implement numeracy and literacy, it is going to be a combination of, you know, so many things. One has to have a vision and clear set learning goals for their schools in terms of literacy and numeracy, and then uh, you know professional development, which is going to have which through which teachers get to know effective strategies of teaching and learning, and then systems and processes in place for the leaders to see if the teachers are really able to implement the professional learning in the class. And you know, of course, um, well-researched resources and access to these resources, and of course, a collaborative uh, approach you know, with the stakeholders, you know, inside and of course outside the school. So, uh, in that sense, it's going to be important, and there's no denying the fact that school leaders have to be catalysts in this process. So, any closing thoughts, Foki and Tom, and then we could continue. Uh, Jayashree, we had Tarvinder who uh, wanted to share. Um... Uh, something that when there it is six one do you want to take like 30 seconds and share something that you yeah, wanted to share we sure. would love to hear you but let's keep it very brief yeah thanks yes ma'am sure am i audible ma'am yes, yes absolutely okay thank you i won't be taking much time i will just be try to be in time only as i truly agree with uh, uh, Ma'am, that clear vision and strategy is, uh, we, ne we need a clear vision, strategy and a collaboration approach for all the levels. But I, being a uh, preschool teacher, I just wanted to share one of my thoughts that what uh, thing I have inculcated in my classes, like these days, I am including a lot of humor into my classes. Uh, even in the preschool level, I have seen that children... Uh, to keep the ki children binded and interesting uh, in create interest in the class they enjoy so much and they get connected so much with the teacher that it has given a fantastic results so this is what is my vision that including humor is going to uh, normalize and you know uh, children uh, become so friendly with you and the learning becomes very very effective that is what my point is thank you so much that was really nice, Tarvinder. I'm glad that you uh, shared that with us and you brought a smile on everyone's face. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. What, what a great closing remark, I think. That's a great thing to end on. Yep, I agree. <laughs> big smile. Yes, so everyone can have a big smile and enjoy the rest of the evening. So thank you, everyone, for making it. Um, Spoky, Tom. Tom, it's been wonderful to have you in all the three sessions and uh, you have uh, really, uh, you know, encouraged everyone to come back to these sessions. Uh, we've had great participation. Uh, we've had 100 people on Zoom and an equal um, uh, number on YouTube watching it live, uh, which, which means that people are really interested in what Adyan is doing in the community of practice and uh, uh, thanks, Tom, for collaborating uh, so closely and deeply with us on this triad series. So, thank you oh, very thanks much, for the invitation. Tom. And so <laughs> Anything else, Jayashree? Do we need to remind anybody about anything? <laughs> Is that done? Yeah, I uh, think, yeah. Are we sending out a Google form to ask about... Uh, um, no, that's there on the uh, live. So, that's there yeah. on the live, okay. 